from flowers that soar with beauty to an arborist who swings from limbs with great ease, this show will take us to great heights. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're getting ready for spring or getting ready for summer, there are just some basic fundamental things that always apply in the garden. For instance, look at these gorgeous containers. These are full of English daisies, started them in the spring, and they're performing so beautifully and I grew them all from seed. Now I did keep them in my greenhouse where they were able to be protected from really cold weather. But the point I want to make is the soil makes such a difference. So today, as we talk about going to great heights in the garden, we're going to be talking about verticality. If you're growing things in containers, you want to start with a soil mix that is designed for container gardening. Now, we're going to take a look at a friend of mine who is really, should be an Olympic winner, the way he swings from the trees and has taken care of the trees out at the Garden Home Retreat. We're also going to check in with one of my favorite flowers. It's perfect for summer and it will come back year after year. And you're gonna love the recipe that we've got coming up a little later in the show. But next, we're gonna get focused on color, one of my favorite topics, right after this. While it may be true that the bloom of a daylily doesn't last long, by its very name, daylily, it lasts for one day, their color is hard to beat. This beautiful flower puts on its show each year, just as the temperatures start to rev up. I visited Joel Stout at Cricket Hill Daylily Farm to learn more about how this flower has dazzled gardeners for ages. We grow perennials, uh, mostly daylilies and hostas and other uh, shrubs, small trees, and quality plants. There are many reasons why daylily is a, a popular flower to grow. It's easy to take care of once it is, is established. It's a perennial that continues to come back year after year. And if it's a favorite, people can share it with each other. You can dig the clump and divide it. So there's always neighbors or friends or relatives that can enjoy it with you. Daylilies are very easy to grow. They appreciate a good garden soil uh, that has humus mixed in like most other plants. After they're established, they, they can't do anything wrong to them. They have uh, very few pests or problems that you have to give special care for. The better culture that you give them, the better bloom and growth habit they will have but if you go on vacation, they're not gonna die. They, they just wait for you to come back and take care of them again. They're called daylilies because each individual bloom is just open for one day. Uh, sometimes they open in the evening of the, the evening before and stay open through the next day. Sometimes they just open up early that morning and are open for one day. On of each plant, there is usually several bloomscapes that come up and there can be anywhere from uh, 10 or 15 to 50 or 60 buds on that one scape. Often two or three are open at a time, so usually the normal bloom time is about a month. There's many, many, many different shapes and forms and colors on the daylilies, and that's why most everybody has several. Uh, there's large flowers, there's medium-sized flowers, there's small miniatures that are just like an inch and a half across. Uh, there's doubles that have several extra petals. It makes it look like a peony bloom, uh, real full. Uh, the last 10 years, they've been coming out with a lot of edges. Sometimes it's a picketty edge that will match the color of the eye, and often it's a gold or silver bubbly edge out around the, the edge, and often there's a, a color plus a gold or silver edge. So the all of the designs and colors and combinations can vary very widely. Now if you're looking for long-lasting color in the garden, say color that will last from spring till fall, 
then you'll want to stay tuned for a look at some of the hot plants popping up in garden centers and nurseries this summer. And a little later, he's not a superhero, but he sure swings around that tree like one. You'll meet a professional arborist and hear his recommendations for keeping mature trees like this one in tip-top shape. I love plants, always have, and I like finding unique ways to use them in the garden. And one of the most underutilized ways is taking plants and growing them on the vertical. Like with this trellis I made with just rustic cedar. You can push this down in a container and grow a rose on it. It can be really effective. Or say this container where I've got some seedlings coming up. You can just take bamboo sticks, shove them in the side, about four of them, pull them together like this. Just take some jute twine and wind it around all the way to the top, and you can grow anything up this. A beautiful clematis, scarlet honeysuckle, hyacinth bean vine, or that beautiful cypress vine with the bright red flower that hummingbirds adore. Of course, there are unique ways to use plants, and then there are just unique plants. During a visit to proven winners Euro-American Propagators, I caught up with John Rader, who shared with us some of the new varieties that are starting to catch the eye of gardeners all across the country. John, I have to compliment you on how beautiful everything looks. Well, thank you, Alan. We work real hard to be able to show off what we're gonna have next spring. Well, you know, it's just so exciting to come and see all these new plant introductions. You know, you, just when you think you've seen them all, a new wave comes through and you're excited all over again. Well, it's fascinating. There's so many hobbyists as well as breeding companies out there constantly improving on existing varieties. And then you also get a hobbyist that'll find something out in the wild that just revolutionizes everything. Well, some of the things that I'm very attracted to are your summer bloomers, things that are gonna bring color throughout the entire summer. The little totally tempted bat-faced kufia, that's a fabulous plant. That is a great plant, and I think it's reflective, I think, of what people want in their gardens. They want to be able to plant something that's then going to perform through the hot months of the summer so they don't have to go back out and replant again. And John, I also see a really traditional, classic flower form, the composite, in the way of that gorgeous daisy back there, the Broadway lights. It's like the happy flower. I think sunflowers became in vogue a number of years ago, and these are just kind of carrying on that sunflower theme. And the Broadway lights of the canthamum is very closely related to sunflower, so you get the happy flower. And you really so, do. And I love the way that they, when they open, they're sort of butter yellow, the petals, and then the older the flower becomes, the, the whiter the petals become. Yeah, it's uh, exactly. It's got a, a beautiful, beautiful color as it opens up that cream color, and then it fades a little bit. Then you have the orange center. Just, just a very, very nice traditional daisy. It also has a nice growth habit, fills in very nicely in the, the garden, and it is a perennial. Now what's the deal with this Arctotus you've got growing down there? You don't see those very often. That's one of my pet plants. That's my personal favorite. Classic daisy shape. It looks like a cross between a Gerbera and a Gazania. <laughs> what's interesting about them is that you get some very unique shades with them. Lots of sort of bronzy sort of shades. Even though we have some pinks, they're sort of a bronzy pink at the same time. And uh, it's a great plant, especially in the southern states, because it gives you early winter color. Well, I can tell you, you've got a real passion for the Arctotus, so I bet we'll see a lot of new varieties on the horizon. Yes, well, our collection is one that we've actually uh, worked with a breeder on, and we call them the Ravers. <laughs> so look for the Ravers, and those are, those are my personal passion. Very Arctotus. good. Well, keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Alan. Up next, high-flying adventure at the Garden Home Retreat with a professional arborist. And a little later, we'll get inspired by a fresh garden recipe. Stay with us. I've been growing Supertunia Vista bubblegum for years now, and the blooms never seem to stop. I've also become familiar with another Supertunia color, this one called Bordeaux. Now, if you're not really into pink like you find with bubblegum, this may be the plant for you. You see, the blooms are slightly violet pink, but they have a deep plum throat and the veins really show up. An outstanding flower. It attracts butterflies and hummingbirds and makes a beautiful landscaping addition. The rural garden I've been working on for the past few years is home to seven amazing oak trees. And I recently invited arborist Mark Chisholm to the garden home retreat to give me some tips on keeping these beauties in tip top shape. Hey, Mark. Hey, Alan, how are you? I'm doing great. great. Thanks for coming out here. My pleasure. 
Well, we really are excited about the work you're going to do. Yeah, I'm very excited, too. These trees are just magnificent. We call them the Seven Sisters. Uh, there's seven of them, and I guess one of them could be designated as the Big Sister. What are the first things you look for? Generally speaking, we look at things like uh, the, what we call the three Ds, which is dead, diseased, and dying. What about the actual getting to the cuts? I mean, there's a, the how-to of this. Cutting a branch uh, requires a lot of things to consider, depending on the size. A small branch is very easy to go up with a, with a pair of hand snips or a handsaw and just hold on to it and make a proper cut. But when you're using larger limbs especially, you got to think about a few things. If you're using a chainsaw, you have to obviously know about chainsaw safety. What we try to do is make a cut that will eliminate the branch without damaging the trunk tissue. So Mark, is there a particular time when a homeowner should really consider bringing in a professional? Rule of thumb is if you haven't tackled it yourself very, very often or you're just not feeling it's, that you're very comfortable with the situation, uh, perfect time to call in a pro. Uh, another reason is whenever you have to take your, your, your cutting or pruning practices above ground, I think it's a, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, as an arborist, uh, we don't work without firm footing on the ground or being anchored to the tree or in a lift. Sure. I'm sure to that point, having the right equipment is, is really important. We never work in a tree without having our personal protective equipment. Uh, and it starts with uh, head protection, which is a helmet or a hard hat, depending on your application. As a climber, we need to have a helmet situated on our head. And this helmet uh, is built for climbers because it allows me to have a, a chin strap. And if I turn upside down, it stays on my head and keeps protecting my head. And then we move into the eye protection, which of course is, is definitely a, a must have uh, so that it's impact resistant and made for, for this particular type of work. And lastly, we have chainsaw protection in the form of chainsaw pants or, or also in chaps. And this, these pants are made to, uh, to have material that will actually stop the chain from moving once it comes in contact with that material, it pulls out and stops the chain very quickly. Well, I guess it's time to get to work. Sounds good. I'm going to get suited up and get at it. Well, I can't wait to see how you whip them into shape. You know, I always enjoy showing you some of the gardens that I've created, but from time to time I like to show you gardens that others have created, such as this one created by Master Gardener Debbie Mickle. We originally set out for a shade garden. Um, we had 13 more trees than we have right now. They were lost. Uh, some of them were hickories that have a short lifespan. Uh, cherry laurels, which Mrs. Bridges put in. A lot of pines died. So because we lost the trees, we had to continually move some of the plant material that we originally started with. And it, we were able to introduce more sun-tolerant plants, like roses and actually a lot of spireas, um, lavender, just a lot of things, day lilies, some that could handle more sun and couldn't tolerate as much shade as I originally had. When we started out, the original plants were chosen because they bloomed in April. Since my husband, my dogs, and my boys all were born in April, it was really important to have things blooming at their birthday. Um, we have very little wall space inside this house. We have tons of windows, and we didn't have any place to hang pictures. So it was real important to me to, no matter where you were in the house, that if you stopped, you always had vision and privacy, no matter where you looked. I'm not a big fan of fences. I want someone to see something green. I don't really particularly care to see someone's house or their cars. So it was very important to build up a natural screen with a lot of color and then do seasonal color whenever possible. We're putting together some fresh garden ingredients, the scrumptious chilled garden radish soup, coming up next. I have to say I always enjoy any opportunity I can to go to the Capitol Hotel. It's such a distinctive and historic place. And of course, Ashley's Restaurant, well known for exquisite cuisine. We had a chance to follow Chef Matthew McClure as he put together this chilled radish garden soup with country ham and honey. So what I'm making today is a chilled garden radish soup. Uh, this soup is very easy to prepare. You can um, grow the ingredients uh, in your garden. I like to start by cutting the leeks. You can grow them or you can get them at the farmer's market locally. Not too small, but I'm um, trying to keep everything about the same size. We're using 
um, a couple of different varieties of uh, baby radishes, uh, shallots. This soup is pureed, so it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be pretty looking. Uh, right now, I'm just adding the radishes to the sweated out uh, leeks and shallots. You want to season it while it's still warm so the salt can dissolve. At this point, I'm going to add water. You can add a veg stock. Now, I am going to make um, the garnish. The garnish is essentially diced up. The radishes have been diced up a little bit. We have some local honey here. A splash of cherry vinegar. It just really just takes a little bit of water to loosen up the honey. So I've been cooking the soup for about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more. So just make sure you have the right ratio of radishes to water. You don't want to have a soup that's too thick, but if it's too thick, it's easier to make it thin. So just let this puree. And this soup is chilled. So after this process, you want to refrigerate it or put it in an ice bath. And the way I usually garnish this soup is a little bit of the pickled honey radish, a little bit of the fresh chopped chives, a little creme fraiche, and a little fried country ham. Uh, you can have this soup, if you keep it vegetarian, just omit the creme fraiche and the country ham. And that's how I make it. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. The thing I want to leave you with is to look up in the garden. Take advantages of vertical opportunities. Make some creative trellises like these, or come up with your own. Any of the information in today's show can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com, and you'll certainly find that delicious recipe for radish soup there. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile